Good evening, Allen Temple friends and family, and welcome back to another edition of Theological Thursdays. I am Reverend Dr. Jacqueline Thompson, Senior Pastor of the Allen Temple Baptist Church, and you are joining us once again for another discussion and conversation around the issues that we are facing as a result of the times that we are living in. We are in the midst of a pandemic. We are seeing the rise of white supremacy. We are facing literally 13 days away an election, and all of this, all of this, our ability uh, to not gather, having to deal with technology, raises issues for us as people of faith if we are thinking, critical thinking people of faith. And so we decided to use this time here at Allen Temple to be honest and to deal with these issues authentically and to bring in area experts and people that we know uh, do this work to help guide us and lead us and settle us and speak to us um, and help us make it through this time. So thank you once again, please share, ask other people to join us. No matter when you see this, I pray that it's a blessing to you. And before we get started tonight, a couple of things as always, we have some announcements. Thank you so much for your tremendous support of our 101st anniversary that we celebrated last week. It was certainly an amazing time in the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your presence and your support. If you did not see the service, it is still available. Go to all of our platforms and you'll be able to view it there. I mentioned during the service that we were not asking for an anniversary assessment. We recognize the times that we are living in, but there have been those who have inquired if they can still uh, send it in. Absolutely, you can send it in. And so for those of you who want to share your anniversary assessment, you can text to give, you can mail it in, you can go to our website and give that way. And I certainly thank you so very much for your consistent and faithful support. Second thing I want to lift up as always, we are back testing. We're not testing every day, but on Tuesdays and Thursdays between 11 and 5, you can come have a COVID test. Share this with your friends, with your family. If you are working outside of the home, if you are volunteering outside of the home, if you are just trafficking these streets that are now open and populated as if we are not in a pandemic and you you need to be tested. It's better to be safe than sorry. We are still, of course, washing our hands. We are still sheltering in place, but the service is available and we wanna make sure that it's utilized. So again, visit us on all our platforms and our website. If you need that information, an appointment is not required, but it is recommended and appointments open up two days in advance. So you are able, we're testing today. We've tested today. So you'll be able to start making your appointments for Tuesday, I believe starting Saturday. So just go to the website and check. So we wanna make sure that you're able to do that. Last and certainly not least, we're closing out anniversary month. I still have my blue on. That's part of our colors. And this weekend, our Leadership Institute will be hosting its annual Dr. J. Alfred Smith Senior Lecture. And our lecturer is none other than our local favorite, Dr. Alvin Bernstein, who has authored a new book that he's going to lecture to us about. That's going to be this Saturday at 9 a.m. So we are looking for all of you to join us. If you want to register to participate in this lecture, again, you can go to our website, go to our Facebook page. It is an event bright event. So just check that out. Make sure you're registered and we will have the Zoom link. Now for our conversation. When I was praying and asking the Lord what we needed to engage around, there were several things that were informing uh, my thought process. The first is we are 13 days out from November 3rd. 13 days out for, at least in my opinion, um, will be one of the most critical elections of our lifetime. And there's lots of things that are going on, all of the normal things that we see, all of the ads, uh, all of the emails, all of the door hangers, all of the signs. And yet we are also on the verge of confirming a Supreme Court justice that we literally know absolutely nothing about. We remain divided in ways that are not healthy for us that are not good for us, that are not godly. And the death toll continues to rise, continues to rise. And so I know many of us have taken our pictures and have our I voted signs. And I believe that it was good to have a worthy conversation about what should be guiding our decision-making. Decisions, decisions. Not just in this election, but in our homes, on our jobs in our churches, in our ministries? What is it that you consult when it's time for you to make a decision? What informs your decision-making? And so when I thought of who I could engage around this conversation, 
There was no more worthy partner than someone that you all know very, very well. Uh, she has definitely been my partner in crime, not just during this pandemic, but ooh, I don't even want to say how long. Let's just say we met a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, and you are accustomed to her being behind the scenes. But tonight she's going to come on camera. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. None other than our very own Reverend Charlotte Williams, who, if you did not know, um, teaches ethics as a part of Fuller Theological Seminary's uh, theology program. And so I want to welcome her to the platform tonight and thank her for being our conversation partner. Please affirm her in the comments so she will uh, say yes again when we have to do these things again. Reverend Charlotte, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thank you, Pastor. And no, we're not telling anybody how long we've been partners in crime. That's not their business. Indeed, indeed. Well, I know you, of course, and so, but some of the people may not know some of your background. They know that you do the, the technological side for us at the church and the emails and the announcements and all the rest of that. But um, share with them just a little bit of how you have come to this, that you have corporate experience and now you're teaching at the seminary level and have been for a while. So just tell the people a little bit about Reverend Charlotte. Well, it's very interesting as I look back and see what God has brought me brought through and brought me to. I spent 15 years doing corporate retail, had an amazing career, um, duty-free shoppers, Sephora, very brief stint at Williams-Sonoma, but what is most interesting about it is that I did not live in the States when I was doing the majority of that work. Um, my work has taken me through Hong Kong, Singapore, Toronto, and pretty much every major Asian country. And I came home. And you home. speak how many languages? Five. All right. Five. But please know that Ebonics is number one, and I'm a gifted at code switching. So, <laughs> as we all are, if you're of a certain generation, yeah. As we all are. And how did you come to to working in the field of ethics? It was very interesting when I went into Fuller um, for my MDiv. My goal had been to be an urban ministries um, major. I figured, okay, well, you know, urban ministries is what I know. Born and raised in the black church, and proud of it. And when taking a required course in, at Fuller, um, Introduction to Christian Ethics by Dr. Ron Sanders, I literally heard the voice of God in the classroom simply because it worked with the way my mind works in that there are no easy answers that you get to dig and you get to bounce theory on the practical and to come to find out that common sense really isn't common and that you must dig deeper to get the answer on how is it that Jesus really taught us how to live. Well, thank you for sharing. And I'm sure the people, many of them, that's new information for them. And so now they get to know a little bit more about you. And so let me give you a little context for what was on my heart for tonight. So it's, it's lots of things. As usual, every week, people think we plan it out. No, I literally pray, wake up and say, whew, we need to talk about this, <laughs> as well as whatever is driven on the news as we're taught as theologians, the Bible in one hand, the newspaper in mm -hmm. the other. And so there has been a song in my spirit, the old song. Some of you may remember it. We used to sing it in church, lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead, I will not stray. Lord, let me walk each day with the lead me, Lord, lead me. And it was critical, I think, because I'm thinking about the elections, I'm thinking about commercials, I'm thinking about propositions, and it can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming. And the reality is we pray and ask for the Spirit's leading and ask for God's leading, but the decisions are ours. And so I felt it would be good for us to have a conversation as followers of Jesus Christ about decision-making and what informs our decision-making and what we rely on if we say we are followers of Jesus Christ to inform how we come to a particular decision. And so I recognize that that behavior is ethics, that that is the field of ethics. 
ethics. And so that's why I wanted to engage you to have some conversation around what ethics is, around the distinction between ethics and values, and then what are some principles that we can share with people, some ethical principles, guidelines that will help them uh, in the ballot box. And of course, there's always a text that we will come to uh, in a bit. But for the people, can you define for us and you know keep us out the seminary put us half in <laughs> half out you know we can do, do the highbrow we're Alan Temple we're accustomed to the highbrow but you know we want people to get it because this is this is critical they need to make decisions about their lives their families their health their future so what is ethics what is it Christian ethics the definition of it is the study of the way of life that Jesus set forth for us and applying that way of life to the daily demands and decisions of our existence as human beings. It's that simple. That's okay. what Christian ethics are. So when you talk about being ethical or, or making, when we as believers talk about being ethical, we are saying that we are lifting up Jesus Christ as our guide, as our model to exactly. inform how we make decisions. Exactly. Okay, so tell us one more time. I feel like I'm in class. Tell me one more time. Christian okay. ethics is? The study of the way of life that Jesus set forth applied to the daily demands and decisions of human existence. Okay, so the, the, the ways of Jesus applied to our daily decisions. That's so really, right. back in the day when we had those bracelets, what would Jesus do? Okay, so then that was really reflective of um, an attempt at an ethical method, an ethical way of being in the world. Exactly. That. Okay. Exactly. Because okay. it is said that the average adult makes 35,000 decisions up to a day. Listen, that was pre-pandemic. I would dare say that's 50,000. If days. not more. If not yes. more. So you're literally applying the life of Christ to everything. What's the first thing you do when you open your eyes? Do you talk yes. to God and say, thank you, Lord, I opened my eyes up? Or do you grab your phone and see what's been popping off while you've been asleep? Yes. Are yes. you going to yes. are you going to cut somebody off in traffic? Are you going to say, no, I can wait all the way to the major decisions that we're making that are so publicized in media? And that's what we're, we're looking at now, um, because the other thing that I wanted to make sure we lifted up for people is you will hear in particular circles around this time right? Particularly mm -hmm. religious circles, we are encouraged and challenged to vote our values, vote your values, vote your value. What, what do we value? But I am challenged by that. And I am challenged by that because I recognize that it is possible to share the same values and still arrive at very different decisions. For instance, I think all of us would say we value uh, life. We value children, we value family. But then when it comes to the decisions that we make to life and children and values, Christian people, people both who say they are followers of the way, followers of Jesus, who have the, him as their example, his life, arrive at very different decisions when it comes to life, family, children. So there are those of us who will say, we believe in the right to life. We are pro-life. That means we're anti-abortion. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't believe in life, right? If you believe in life, you can't do that. But there are those of us who also say that is wonderful. You believe life starts in the womb, beautiful. But can you also acknowledge that once the life comes out of the womb, that they ought to have a right to education and a right to clean water and a life, right? And right. so we are valuing the same thing but we are arriving at very different conclusions and decisions. And so if you had to lift up for us, what is the distinction or is there a distinction between values, what we are hearing and ethics? What is, is there a distinction? And if so, what is it? There's a huge distinction, huge. So let's start with values-based voting, being, existing, living, whatever. Values 
in that case, refer to the beliefs you have for which you have a preference for. So let, let, let's narrow that down into what we're looking at here in today. We have a segment, the Republican Party, that holds up values that put loading the judiciary in front, in the front seat. As you said before, putting someone on the Supreme Court who we really don't know anything about or how we're going to pay or receive a price for that seat. Perhaps their values are keeping immigrants out of the country, but you have over 500 children now who don't know where their parents are because they've lost them. Those are values, your preference. So you vote for and stand for the people who keep your preferences going forward. Okay. But then let's flip it. Let's look at ethics. Ethics are the set of rules that govern your individual behavior. And that set of rules is established by a particular group or a culture. And in our case, people of the way, Christian, Christian beliefs, following the way of life set forth by Jesus himself. Okay, so then for those of us who know us, who know our context, know our DNA as a church and as a family of believers, a community of faith, then this would be why we lift up uh, that Luke 4 text where Jesus announces that, you know, I've, here's why I've come. Here's what I've come to proclaim. I've come to set captives free. I've come to, because for us, that becomes um, the, the way of life or the, or the ethical basis for how we make decisions around ministries and, and, and causes that we take up and how we, how we even see the text. So is that an example? That's an excellent example. Basically, it's be, not being afraid to shake the table or to come in and turn the table over. And I just have this picture in my head when we remember as a church in the eighties, we took to the streets and did the March on Righteousness. Absolutely, absolutely. Not being afraid to shake the table, whatever it was, whether it was anti-apartheid, whether it's private prisons, whether it was at the point where the crematorium was going to be built just blocks from our church, whether right. or BRT, it is, there you go, access, or the violence that's increasing in our community, access to testing, yes, you name it, right. that's what governs your behavior because you want to see, and this is very womanist ethics, what I'm about to say, community must benefit, we all benefit together. And Lord knows that womanist conversation is one that is coming. And so for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, we'll bring all of that out too. And let me be very, very clear. I recognize that even in our congregation, we have some that are Democrats, we have some that are Republicans. And that is why we are trying to elevate the conversation. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you are a follower of Jesus Christ, we are trying to say to you that platforms ought not be what informs your decisions that you have to have something higher, something more grounded, something that is solid. And for us as believers, we are lifting up for you saying that that is the way, the method, the life, the conclusion found in the person of, of Jesus Christ. And here's why, again, it was critical. So, you know, we, this is a theological foundation. And so we have to go to scripture. So if you are out there, get your Bibles, get your phones, get your iPads, all the paper Bibles saved, folks. You all should have some paper Bibles. Have them in your homes because you may not be able to touch them in church. Ever, ever again. <laughs> we may have to take them out. But the, the text that informed this conversation for me was found in First Chronicles chapter 21. So you all find First Chronicles chapter 21. In all honesty, it's probably the whole chapter, but those verses, we could probably start. Do you have a Reverend Charlotte? I do. Where are we starting? We are probably going to start. I'll start reading at verse seven. We'll stop at verse 15 and then come back and have a little 
context about it. So do you all have it? Type it in the chat, First Chronicles. Go to that table of contents. Don't feel no shame and find it. Do not be in First Corinthians if we are in First Chronicles. <laughs> the Bible says this is the NIV. So it says this command was also evil in the sight of God. So he punished Israel. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant because I've done a very foolish thing. The Lord said to Gad, David's seer, go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. So Gad went to David and said to him, this is what the Lord says, take your choice. These were the choices. Three years of famine, three months of being swept away with, by your enemies, and or three days of the sword of the Lord, meaning days of plague in the land with the angel of the Lord ravaging every part of Israel. Now then, decide. There we go with decision making. How I should answer the one who sent me. David said to Gad, I'm in deep distress. He said, let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great, but do not let me fall into human hands. So the Lord sent a plague on Israel and 70,000 men of Israel fell dead. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But as the angel was doing so, the Lord saw it and relented concerning the disaster and said, enough, withdraw your hand. And the angel of the Lord was then standing at the threshing floor of a round of the Jebusite. I'm going to stop there. The reason why I think this text spoke to me so is because the context is, David starts out saying, I made a horrible decision. Right, that's what he's saying. If you go back, everyone, in earlier in the text, the decision, the text talks about how David decided he was going to take a census of the people. And I think verse one says that Satan influenced him to do so. We don't know whether Satan was the personified evil that we hear of as the common word Satan or whether Satan was some kind of unwise counselor or actual adversary. But either way, David made a decision that God was not pleased with. And David didn't realize that he had made a decision that God was not pleased with. And what bothered me about it is that one person made a decision that adversely impacted 70,000 other people. And on the face of it, it just, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair. And so when you are looking at Christian ethics, my question for you, when you are looking at what should be informing our decision-making, what role should impact play in our consideration? Because it was one, it's one thing. David made a decision. David suffers the consequences. I don't have no problem with that. But if David makes a decision and my husband and my son have to die, as a result, then you know, and so as we're considering, yes, we cast our individual votes, but our votes have impact. So what should we be considering? Is impact a, a consideration ethically? Impact is huge. And let's also put into the mix, not just the impact of what your vote is, but whether you vote at all. Mm. Staying home has a tremendous impact as well it does it just does so what we want to look at is what our loyalty is who are we loyal to as christians are we loyal to the united states of america in god we trust on the back of our money and whatnot but we're loyal to god and not to the state meaning our government and our loyalty has to always be tempered and colored with the fact that we must insist on justice. And justice has a twin called love. And those twins call for equality and liberty that hold 
our government under restraint and an accountability to God. So what am I saying when I'm saying all of that? When we cast our votes, when we stand on a particular platform and whatnot, are we really standing on the side of justice and love? Or are we standing on a platform of that'll do, it's all right, maybe it'll work, or I don't care? Because that, I'm hearing all of those things from people right now. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've, I've made it the past three and a half years. Another term can't be that bad. Have you really made it the past three and a half years? What have you lost and what do you stand to lose? And even more so, what do your children and your children's children stand to lose? And I would dare say, I think I would even shift it out further because I think part of what is bothering, and of course, we still have yet to learn sometimes as a people how others will use us as pawns and they will lift mm -hmm. us up at this time during the election for the sake of, you know, getting us to commit. And then when it's over, uh, we don't see them again. And to be honest, that is true on both sides of the yeah. aisle. Right. So that's, mm -hmm. that's just a true story. But the reality is there are some of us. There are, if we're honest about it, God has blessed us. You know, we are in a place where if we look back, we don't say we don't, we haven't been that adversely impacted. Oh, and so it should be okay. But do we have an ethical responsibility outside of our own home? We all know that we'll do whatever protects ourselves, our family, our children, whatever's close to us. But there are those. And if we're looking at Jesus, that's who Jesus ministered to. There are those for whom that is not true. There are those who are losing their jobs right now. There are those for whom uh, they're deciding between eating and taking their medicine right now. Should we consider how what we do may impact them? Is that an ethical underpinning that should, should inform us? Most definitely, because in ethics, we look beyond the individual and we look at God's good creation, community, the world. And it's not just our sisters and our brothers and our neighbors who are unemployed or underemployed right now. Let's also look at our standing in the world. Yeah. That we are becoming a pariah. Um, you have to look beyond your front door. You have to, because otherwise it becomes a cheap ethic, if you mm -hmm. don't. Ethics are not ethic. a, cheap a cheap ethic, ethic. a cheap yeah. ethic, mm -hmm. because ethics are not designed, I would say, in the terms of a prosperity type thing where, oh, it's all good for me. Hooray, hooray, hooray. No, it is making sure that the upside down kingdom comes into fruition. And those who are last are first. And you can't be that until you come into your fullness. And for those of you who are wondering, and, and you've been saying uh, amongst yourselves, I thank God that you <laughs> kept it amongst yourselves and you haven't brought it to me. Uh, are we open? When are we opening? Are we going to consider opening? I hope this gives you a little insight into my no. Because. Yes, we recognize we're in phases. Yes, we recognize um, that things are opening. The county has just re-released their order that you can gather. I think it's again at 25% of your capacity or 100 people, whatever is less. But when you have to make a decision, right? You have to consider not just how the decision impacts you, which is where David went wrong in this text, but how the consequence may impact somebody else. And so we can't posture ourselves, uh, even if we want to, even if it would be safe for us, even if we have no underlying conditions, even if we are not in the population being asked to stay home, we have to consider our seniors, our children, those who have underlying health conditions. And that means as leaders, we make sure that we don't create an environment where that kind of consequence and devastation can happen. So ethics is such a huge part. If you are a leader on your job, leader in your family, no matter where decisions have to happen, you, what informs your ethics is just a critical part of it. Mm 
So Reverend, if you had to share with people as they're considering once again, decisions, am I going out? And it's little stuff. It's, you know, am I going to the target? <laughs> now that everything is open, <laughs> they've, they've opened the mall. You know, I don't need anything, but am I just going to go look? Because people are contracting. They don't know how they're contracting. So even those kinds of decisions, do you have, what can you share with the people as to what should be informing those decisions? Even the, the fight to put a mask on. Let me back up, Pastor, onto something you shared about your very strong and very firm pastoral decision not to reopen to the way it was. You would be committing ethical malpractice mm. if the people to whom you have been entrusted by God to shepherd and you brought us all back into the way it was from the second Sunday in March of this year before. It would be ethical malpractice to not know because you don't know. The fact that you can be asymptomatic, walk around, feel fine and kill somebody. Yes, yes. Always that's it. bothers me. Yeah. Um, you can't do it. So when you're going to Target, when you decide, oh, I'm just going to go and I'm just going to go hang out and I'm going to find somebody who's got a house party going on. Your ethical decision, who do I affect? Who do I come in contact with? Do I have enough agape love for my sister or my brother that mm. I am not going to expose them to something where I may feel fine, but they could be on a ventilator inside of 14 days. And could they also suffer from long COVID? There are people who got COVID early on who are still suffering in a myriad of ways. So I like that. I like that because that lens helps people mm -hmm. hear. I hope you all, I, I wanted to have this conversation because I wanted to give you a filter as you are listening to the news, as you are viewing the ads or you're, as you're talking amongst and engaging amongst yourselves. I want to give you another lens with which to filter that information that's coming in. And so even though we have all of those who are on this side saying, we got a right to gather, we got a right to worship, we got a right to do this, all of that is true. I don't disagree with any of that. But the question becomes, is that the ethical way of God? Is that the highest and best form of love I can have for my neighbor? Or is that about what I want to do and what I think is right in light of the fact that it could potentially wreak havoc on innocent people who have no idea that they are being exposed. That's an excellent, excellent, excellent lens. Thank you so much for that. If Another we, context. I got a good one. I got a good one here. If loving my neighbor is one of the highest and best forms of demonstrating God's love for all of us, Wearing a strip of fabric over my mouth when I go out is a small price to pay. Right. It's a small price to pay to be Christ-like. Because I firmly believe if Jesus was walking among us, he'd have a mask on. Right. Now you're getting in trouble because they would say, no, Jesus could just wave his hand and heal everybody. <laughs> fully human, fully human, <laughs> fully human, and he'd be wearing a mask. <laughs> And again, so it, it seems like that 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 while values are centered on our personal preferences, that can I say safely that ethics is really about community? It is. It is. Okay, so Alan Temple, here's what I want to do. And those of you who are visiting, and we all have our why as to why we do what we do. And Reverend Charlotte has her why. So I need her why to come on real quick. Just can she come on? Where is she? But again, so when we are thinking of the decisions that we are making, we are not just considering ourselves, we're considering impact on beautiful ladies like this. The voice of Alan Temple, say hi to the people. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> I didn't know that I was on. You are on Theological Thursdays. I just wanted you to greet the people. We miss your voice. 
We love you, and we cannot wait until God allows us to come together safely. So I know they're typing in the chat. Say hi, Miss Betty, in the chat, so she'll be able to oh see and know you're speaking goodness. to her. But, but you look you are, beautiful. Thank you. This thank is my you. why. This is why I wear a mask. This is why <laughs> things sit at the door and get sprayed down with Lysol. <laughs> this is my why. Exactly. And I know and I know that you have your why, the wonderful. I have my why. Have and we all you. have our why. Those who yeah. are viewing us tonight, we know that you have your why's. And we are trying to suggest to you that as you are going about making these decisions, this huge decision about this critical election, that you consider your why, but you also consider the why that, that moved the heart of God. Yes. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus made it very clear. He came for the oppressed. He came for the captive. He came for the voiceless and the defenseless and the naked and those who were thirsty. That's who Jesus was concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so the decision that we make in this hour right. ought to be a decision that is not just informed by what we value, but it has to be informed by what God valued. And let the ethics, our Christian understanding of ethics as followers of Jesus Christ, inform some of the decisions that we make. So tell me this. Let's shift it a little bit. Let's shift it a little bit. Tell me about or tell us about uh, one of the difficult decisions you had to make and what informed your eventual decision. One of the most difficult decisions I had to make was actually coming home. Mm -hmm. coming home. Um, I was quite happy living as an expat and living abroad and the power of a blue passport that could get you anywhere and knowing people of different cultures and whatnot. But things weren't good. And my peace was being chastised and I wasn't going to be peaceful until I was back here. Now, what is that thing about peace? Because I often tell people when they have to make a decision, um, that is one of the signs. When people say, how do I know what God wants me to do? How do I know what's the right decision or the wrong decision? One of the signs I lift up for people is that generally uh, you will know that it is a God decision because there is a peace that comes over you regardless of the consequence, no matter what it comes with. So what, what is that peace about? well said, regardless of the consequences. And my consequence was giving up a six-figure career and being on the so-called corporate ladder, going up, starting to shatter some ceilings, moving forward, doing things that nobody had done before. But I knew I didn't have peace. I wasn't sleeping. I was very cranky with everybody, but even more so. Anytime I would sleep, all I would see was the Golden Gate Bridge. Hmm. That hmm. was it. All I would see was the now, Golden Gate Now, what is Bridge. that concept you lifted up for me earlier? Is there a concept of like a community piece? You were talking about shalom in Hebrew. Yes. And the term is known as the vandalization of shalom. Literally what it sounds like, your shalom being vandalized. And you have to understand that with the Hebrew word for peace being shalom, in English and in our translation, we have a tendency just to say it is peace, but that's not enough. When you break it down to what it really means, shalom is completion. It's wholeness. It is, it's almost everything. It's that warm, fuzzy feeling that you get. And in the Bible, shalom is universal flourishing, universal wholeness, universal. And so flourishing. does that mean, does that mean in our particular con context that we can't just be concerned about our individual peace, but that we can't really have peace unless our community is at peace? Correct. Because true shalom isn't just fighting one another like we have a tendency to do, especially in political seasons, or avoiding conflict by being like an ostrich and sticking our head in the sand. What it means is ordering things right and proper, things that are broken being restored, 
as a people, as community, working together towards the kingdom of God that we are supposed to have, reconciling and restoring all things. And so that calls us to be bearers of one another's burdens. Exactly. And so we don't have to be related to George Floyd. We don't have to be related, related to Breonna Taylor. We don't have to be related to Oscar Grant to be able to stand in solidarity with those causes because until there is peace for all of us, then none of us will ever really have the kind of shalom that you are describing. Exactly, and I'd even take it further. If shalom, meaning wholeness, would mean justice, and if you don't have shalom, you don't have justice, no justice, no peace. Hmm. So is no justice, no peace biblical? Sure is, most hmm. definitely is. And if you look at the life of Christ and you look at it where, you know, it's very popular in ethics to study peacekeeping and peacemaking. And I'd argue that Jesus was not a peacekeeper. He was a peacemaker. Why was that? He got angry. He flipped tables. He used strong words when he saw people's shalom being vandalized, when their wholeness was under attack. And honestly, uh, and, and, you know, folk will get up, upset, but that is also the concept, biblically and theologically. Um, here we go. Y'all can be mad. It's all right. You know, I stay in trouble, so it don't matter. But when people, when young people and when activists get upset, when we express our concern about buildings that are damaged without acknowledging that buildings are damaged because people have been damaged. And when you fail to acknowledge, quote unquote, as you have placed it, the vandalization of people's peace mm -hmm. since 1619, mm -hmm. you can expect a car to be flipped over or a building to be burned or a window to be broken. And so it really is calling us uh, to be bearers of one another's burdens to begin to listen to each other instead of talking at each other so much. And moreover, to really be mindful and reflective of the decisions that we are being called to make at this hour and how those decisions are going to affect somebody else. Exactly. And so AP, I want to lift up for you some things and Reverend Charlotte will lift up. We'll, maybe we'll just go back and forth. And so, because the question is always then, then how do I know? What should I, what should I do? How, how do I know how to make the decision? And so I would offer based on our conversation tonight first, that when you have to make a critical decision, and I would dare say any decision, you have to be clear about what your, what your ethical motivation is. What is your ethical motivation for seeking leadership? What is your ethical motivation for casting this vote? What is your ethical motivation? And so we've already decided that ethics is community-based while values is personally based and ethics considers impact on other people. Values tend to consider impact on ourselves. So if that ethical base is supposed to be the life of Jesus Christ, then very simply, one of the best ways to start is, okay, Lord, what, what, what would Jesus do in, in, this, in this situation? So that would be number one. What would you offer? I would also offer, and I'm going to put it in the lens of this current general election. When you are reading propositions, when you're looking at the candidates and researching their platform, how much do you see the way of Jesus reflected in it? Short term and long term. Where is Jesus in the midst of this? Where? Mm. Where is Jesus in the midst of it? Can you find him? Do you see him? If you don't, that peace may not be there. You may have to go back and do another thought and dig deeper. So what would Jesus do? Where is Jesus in it? As in the ways, the models, the concepts, the teachings in it. Um, I think I would offer three that any decision that you make, 
any decision that you make, whether it's about family, children, yourself, career, uh, shifting, uh, l little things like this. Lord, what shall we talk about? What shall I preach about? You know, order my steps. We sing the song, but, you know, sometimes we need to pray the prayer when we wake up in the morning. Every decision that we make ought to be baptized, bathed, saturated in prayer. And you don't have to go down on your knees like old school, like the deacons and pray in the onlyest way you know how and lie to him and do all the rest of that. But there is something to be said for uh, committing something to God, saying, Lord, you know, nevertheless, not my will, thy will, Lord, be done. What would you have me do in this situation? So I would say that that prayer, what would Jesus do? Where is Jesus in this? And have you prayed? Have you, have you sought the counsel of the God that you claim to follow? How about you? Also, for those of us in ethics, we have, although we use the entire canon of scripture as our guide, we really look at the Sermon on the Mount for the how to do and how to treat one another. Mm -hmm. And I recommend just studying Jesus's words to those people. And when you get into the Beatitudes, start when you're making some decisions, I find them to be very helpful and very soothing. And oftentimes there is at least one Beatitude that answers the decision I'm trying to come to. But study the words of Jesus. Study how he lived and how he instructed us to live. So get lining up your book. decisions with the, the, the words of Jesus. Yes, get in the book. Get in those Indeed. red letters. Get, I mean, get it's in those listen, red letters. Get in listen. it. Get in it. The red letter Bible that my grandmother, um, Dr. Thompson said, that's the only Bible. The letters are not red. Jesus didn't say it. <laughs> and there it is. I would also add, scripture teaches us in Proverbs, you'll find in a number of places, um, that scripture talks about seeking uh, counsel and, and seeking wisdom. And the Bible says that our safety is established in a multitude of counselors. It speaks about uh, we'll be able to wage our own wars um, if we if we seek wisdom, right? And right. James tells us that it's no need for us to be confused. It's no need for us to fret. That if we lack wisdom, that we we need, can go to God, who gives it to all of us liberally and abrade if not. But there are also those who have walked this path before, and their knowledge and their experience. Uh, combined can help enlighten some of the things that we need to do. And so I say, seek counsel, seek, seek advice from those persons who ethically you respect, mm -hmm. right? You can't take everybody's counsel because bad counsel is kind of what got David in his situation anyway. And just to bring a little clarity to that text, uh, the issue was not that David took the census. The census in and of itself was not wrong. We just took one. So I don't want anybody thinking, you know, that it was wrong for us to take the census. But the thinking, the prevailing notion at that time was that the people belonged to God. Right? I want you to hear me. The people belong to God. The people belong not to a pastor. The people don't belong to a board or a ministry. The people don't belong to a president. The people do not belong to a king. The people belong to God. And it was believed that only God could call a census. And when God told Moses to take the census, he said, and the people will have to pay a ransom for their life. When you take the census, the people are going to have to pay you. And so when David called the census without the authority of God, it was the equivalent of taking advantage of the people. So when we look at our leadership today, whether it's in our churches, whether it's on our jobs, whether it's in our nation, are they making decisions, keeping in mind that these are not your people? We are not pawns on a chessboard to be used for the personal preference of somebody's agenda. So that's where David went wrong. And that's why he had to suffer consequence. But the challenge of leadership, which is why no one ought to seek it unless you can handle it is that when you make a decision, you aren't just making it for you. Because even though he made the decision, guess what? All of Israel paid the price. 
And so even the decisions we make in our household, had he prayed before he made the decision and not after he took the census, he might not have arrived in that situation. So I say, okay, so we're saying, what would Jesus do? Is Jesus in it? Where is Jesus bathing it in prayer, seeking counsel? What do you offer? I like the seeking counsel. And here's something people really need to do constantly. Build your little village. You're going to have people who are more knowledgeable on other subjects than other. Bounce it off your folks. Get you a tight little circle of folks. Read, read. Get out there and say, hey, well, I just read this. Um, what you think about that? Um, this doesn't make sense to me. But I would also say, be still. Make, make no decision fast. Yes. Make no decision fast. Some of us are still living the repercussions of decisions we made at the end of the 20th century because we made them too fast. Make no decision too fast. Indeed. The best decisions take time. They indeed, they do. And I think finally I would offer, I think I referenced it in the beginning, um, but I commit your decision to God because mm -hmm. scripture is clear. It says as, as humanity, Scripture says man, but we'll say as humanity, uh, we can write our plan, we can have our plan, but they said it's the will of God, the ultimate plan of God is what's going to be established. And so you may be solid, but God can sanction your decision. And, and one of the major ways that you know your decision has been sanctioned is peace. That peace that we went back to, not just for ourselves, but peace in our communities, peace in our household, peace in our nation. And so do the thing that makes for peace. I've enjoyed this, Reverend Charlotte. This has been fun. This has been good. This has been good. And so I offer, I yield any closing words you would have uh, for the people to know. I will simply say this, for those of you who are making decisions, whatever they are, here's some advice. Take action, and we gave you the action points of what you should do, to do what you can, where you are with what you have. And you, got, you have an arsenal that we have given you this evening. But we are, as Pastor said, coming up on the election of our lives. Pray, study, take your time, have it in by election day before 8 p.m. before the polls close and vote. Too many of our forebears died for the right and it hasn't been that long ago. That's what people, I don't, some, some people don't get. It was just yesterday. Folk. That's what I'm And I'll give you the right. other side of that coin. I'll give you the other side of that coin because I know that there are some of you and we have a generation of young people where the fact that people died doesn't mean anything to you. But I would say vote for your life. That's it. Right? If you can't vote in honor of those that have died, vote for the ones that live, including yourself, mm -hmm. because the decisions that you make now are going to impact the quality of your own life. And I echo and lift up to you, all politics are local. So make sure that you know your local issues as well. I'm so eternally grateful to the members of our public ministries who all this season of pandemic have not failed to come off the front line. They've had panel discussions. They've had town halls. They've put together a suggested ballot around the issues. They've done the work. They've done the research. We we are so blessed to have them. We have a ministry like that because our ethics say <laughs> mm -hmm. that as believers, we don't opt out of a process. We exercise our influence on the process. That's what our, our, our ethics say. And so I thank them. And they are also considering things like picking up your ballot. So if you are there, if you're out there, you don't want to come out and drop it off. If you let us know at the church, we have people who are willing to come pick up your ballot. They're considering, we're trying to consider transportation. If we can do that safely for those of you who need to get to the polls, if you're making a decision to mail it in, check the requirements, make sure you sign it. If you need a witness, make sure you have a witness. We want your ballot to be qualified. But again, not just about the election. It's about your life. That's it. It's about your life. And I never do this on Theological Thursdays, but there are those of you who are out there who need to make some decisions about your life. Mm -hmm. You need to make a decision about your walk with God. 
You need to make a decision that says, how do I want to come out of this closer to God with a deeper relationship and a deeper understanding? And this is a prime time. Every good relationship starts with what? A decision. And so if you are out there tonight and you hear me, and again, I promise you, this is the spirit of God because we don't do this on Theological Thursdays. But if you hear me and you're listening to my voice and you need to know that God is real, we are here to testify God is real. And the fact that you are right here right now, hadn't planned on it, you probably, maybe this isn't even something you went out, came back and came back right at this point that God is real. God hears us when we pray. God sees what we're going through and God is echoing, aching for personal relationship, but God does not superimpose God's will on us. God asks you to decide. You are already chosen, but we still have to make a decision to choose. So I dare you to just type in the chat and just say, that's me. And there's going to be somebody there that will pray for you. If you call us, if you email us, there's somebody who will reach out to you and respond to you. But it really don't take any of that. If you need to accept and come into relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do that with a prayer right now. And all it does is simply acknowledge. It really is this simple, even though people will tell you otherwise. The living, it may be a little more complicated, but the relationship is simple. And it is a simple acknowledgement that I need God in my life. I recognize and I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that Jesus is the model, the son of God. Pray that prayer. God, come into my heart, come into my life, be my savior, be my Lord. And even Jesus said, I knock at the door of your heart. And if you open the door, I come in and I live with you and you live with me. That's a prayer that you can pray right now. And he says, if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, that you will be, not later on down the line, but right now, tonight, in the chat, watching right now, you will be saved. And so if you actually pray that prayer, please let me know, because we want to make sure that you have all of the love, all of the family, all of the resources that you need. Even if you don't become a part of our family, we'll connect you with somewhere where you, if that's where you want to go, we don't have no issue with that. No competition, no hangups here. But we do want you to be in relationship. One of the best decisions you can make is to live a life yielded to the God of our salvation, the creator of heaven and earth. So I was obedient to the spirit of God. We love you tonight. We thank you so much for joining us. I pray that you were blessed by the ministry that you had not experienced necessarily before of Reverend Charlotte Williams. Reverend Charlotte, I'm going to throw it back to you. Would you pray for us? It will be my pleasure. And thank you for having me, Pastor. Much obliged. Absolutely. Eternal God, thank you. Thank you for this evening, for this conversation and for the opportunity to share. But oh God, when we come to the end of the pandemic road, there may be things we have, there may be things that we don't have, but there is one thing that we all can have. And that is a deeper, richer, and stronger relationship with you, O oh God, the God who lives and moves and has your beings. And we thank you. Thank you, God, that for someone who is making a decision and needs to make it tonight, that you're going to be in the midst. Give them the right direction and even more so give them the peace that you promised us that you pour out so richly and so freely. We thank you, God, for our pastor, for our church, for our friends that come to share with us. Bless them all in the way that only you can. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all and we say thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And no, I love you as always with my whole heart. Uh, again, be tested. Visit our website and our platform to find out everything that we're doing. I warn you in advance on Sunday, I'm going to need your help with a little something. I'm still praying about it. So just pray for me. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I will see you Sunday for our final Sunday. Uh, in our October 101st anniversary, I pray that you join us and our guest will be again, Dr. Alvin Bernstein, join us for the lecture. It will be United Men Sunday. So the men will lead us mightily in service as they have for so very long. We love you. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.